Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our West Hour uh, of seminars. As you all know, West is actually an acronym, which stands for Webinars Empowering Science and Technology. Today, I have the great pleasure of introducing uh, one of the people that I've known for quite some time now, uh, since I started here at Precision Nanosystems, Dr. Shidar Lee, or as he's also known, Dr. Starley, or who will be presenting on phospholipid-free small unilaminar vesicles, or PF, SUVs, or hepatocyte target delivery. Prior to starting, I wanted to just go through some of the details that we always go through. Uh, first and foremost, I want to introduce our West team here that supports all of the West region, which includes West of the Mississippi, including Illinois, and also Minnesota and Wisconsin. In our Southwest team, we have uh, Kim Killian, our regional sales manager in the Southwest. We have uh, Viet Nguyen, he's our field application scientist supporting customers in the Southwest region. We have our field application scientists here in the Northwest, uh, Ian Viamanya, and of course, I am Angel Galarza. Thank you for joining us today, really, really appreciate it. If you're ever interested in going back to look at any of our webinars, be them the West webinars or journal clubs, feel free to go on to our YouTube channel for Precision and Assistance and type in WEST, the acronym, OUR, and you'll be able to locate those webinars of interest. Before I start, of course, and pass it over to Dr. Lee, I want just to say a few notes from Dr. Lee Starr, as I've known for quite some time. Uh, Starr has... Uh, he got his PhD at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He got his, did his postdoc at the University of California at San Diego, very close to our hearts here in, in California. He's been at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver for over seven years, uh, where he is the angiotech professor. I had to write that down, Star, because <laughs> and faculty, chair faculty of the nanomedicine and chemical biology uh, board there. His focus in the laboratory is uh, developing innovative drug delivery technologies to enhance drug targeting and interested in, with a specific interest in uh, lipid and polymer-based nanoparticles. Again, it is my great pleasure to introduce someone that I've known for quite some time. I've had a pleasure to have many conversations with. Thank you, Star. We'll hand it over to you, Star. Hey, thank you so much, Andrew, for this nice introduction. And uh, first, I would like to uh, say thank you to uh, Pia and I for this uh, wonderful opportunity to share my work with you today, and also their uh, continuous support to my research program. Um, so I also want to thank you for coming uh, to, to this webinar. So uh, today, I'm really excited to share our recent uh, a pro a research project focusing on developing a really uh, innovative uh, drug delivery system that actually targets the uh, hepatocytes. So, um, but just a little bit background of, uh, um, you know, liposomes and liposomal uh, small unilaminal vesicles or so-called SUVs. Um, so many of you already have a very um, good understanding of what liposomes is. And uh, the, the most uh, well-studied confirmation of liposomes for drug delivery is SUV. So in here, you can see that SUV is a relatively small structure uh, with a particle size below 150 nanometer. And it has one lipid bilayer. So with this structure, it enables uh, liposome SUVs to be able to deliver both hydrophobic drugs and hydrophilic drugs. And uh, you can also decorate a targeting ligand to the surface of liposomes to enhance the specific targeting to uh, your target disease or target cells. Um, so this table actually just summarizes all the um, approved liposomal SUV products so far. So, so far we have nine products and I highlight those were developed uh, in UBC or by UBC Technologies. Um, so actually, I, I believe five out of uh, uh, eight or nine products were uh, developed 
at uh, UBC. So UBC is actually the uh, international hub for uh, liposomal SUV innovation. Um, so again, a little bit background about how we make uh, liposomal SUVs. Uh, normally we use this uh, um, lipid film hydration method. So we, uh, we first uh, uh, dry our lipid into a thin film and then hydrates uh, the thin film with an aqueous phase. So if we want to load hydrophobic drugs, we put them in a mixture with lipids. If uh, we are delivering water-soluble drugs, we dissolve uh, this drug in the aqueous phase. And then uh, these lipids will self-assemble into uh, so-called liposomes in the MLV form, multilamellar vesicle form. And uh, this form of liposomes, uh, the size is pretty big and it has multiple layers of uh, lipid bilayers. Um, so it's, uh, it is already a drug delivery vehicle, but it, is, uh, can, it usually cannot be used for systemic delivery rather than local, localized delivery like topical or just a uh, local injection. Uh, so most people actually perform a membrane extrusion to control the size. First, uh, to reduce the size below 150 nanometer, but in the same time to reduce the, um, the lipid by layer number to just one. Um, so this will give the SUV a good property for a drug targeting or drug delivery. So uh, these are the uh, cryo-EM pictures of uh, MLV. I, again, you can see many layers of lipid by layers and a much larger size here compared to the SUV, just one single bilayer and much smaller size. Um, so the, uh, as I mentioned, people have been using liposomal SUV for drug delivery. And this is the typical biodistribution of a liposomal SUV. As you can see that uh, uh, this is looking at uh, liposome accumulation in different tissues after IV injection. And you see that uh, liver spleen, those macrophage rich tissues actually contribute to uh, majority of uh, liposomal dosage clearance. Uh, we also see a little bit in the bone uh, because uh, these two, three tissues are also uh, so-called reticular endothelial systems. Um, they have a lot, lots of macrophages uh, um, in the tissue. Uh, recognizing foreign particles for clearance. Um, so I, I don't think I need to spend a lot of time uh, talking about why uh, liposomal SUVs are cleared in those tissues. But I just want to show uh, in the, in the uh, liver uh, how this has happened, uh, how this is happening. So you see that uh, this is a uh, liver sinusoidal uh, structure here. So we have uh, uh, hepatocytes here, and we have the uh, sinusoidal blood vessel here. And uh, the blood is flowing through this tube, and we have macrophage sitting on top of the endothelial cells. Um, so if you inject standard liposomal SUVs, they can be uh, heavily recognized by macrophages and then cleared from the blood circulation. And if we blow up this uh, um, process, uh, you can pretty much appreciate that uh, uh, in the blood circulation, uh, liposomes will absorb a lot of uh, serum proteins to their surface. And this process is called opsonization. And these serum proteins can be recognized by scavenger receptors expressed at the surface of uh, macrophages. So that actually leads to um, clearance of uh, standard liposomal SUVs. Um, so lipids or liposomes are not the only form of SUVs. We can actually make SUVs using different materials. So I just talked about the phospholipids uh, can be uh, used to form liposome SUVs, but we can also use uh, di-block copolymer to form polymersomes SUVs. And uh, also we can use non-ionic surfactants to uh, prepare neosomes, uh, which is also a form of SUV. Um, but I wanna emphasize here that uh, 
if you just use pure like 100% non-ionic surfactants, they are going to form isos instead of uh, neosome SUVs. So you need to incorporate some uh, cholesterol to promote this uh, bilayer formation. Um, so we are really interested in this uh, neosome SUV. Uh, but let's talk about limitations that we know of. Uh, first, we know that most of the neosomes developed in the, um, in, in, in the lab are used for tropical applications only. And uh, uh, people have tried to use them for a systemic delivery, but the limitations um, is quite big, and uh, um, there's not a lot of advantages showing over uh, over to, uh, other um, uh, SUVs. Uh, so the the major reason is that uh, these uh, neosomes um, actually have a high content of surfactants. Uh, so this will give them, um, you know, significant toxicity if given uh, systemically. And uh, also, if you incorporate so many uh, molecules of uh, uh, surfactants, it actually makes the the bilayer the the bilayer um, not so stable. Um, so it doesn't really retain drug very efficiently during the blood circulation. So the potential solution is that we can incorporate more cholesterol in there just to stabilize the, uh, the lipid bilayer to make it more stable and also to reduce the, the amount of uh, uh, non-ionic surfactant um, dosage in uh, the, the formulation. Um, but we know this uh, is quite challenging to incorporate more cholesterol into neosomes because uh, cholesterol is really not soluble in water. Um, and the method, the standard method for making lipos uh, neosomal SUV is using thin film hydration as well. So it doesn't really uh, promote incorporation of cholesterol using this uh, uh, standard methods. Um, so the, the, uh, the maximum amount that people were able to incorporate cholesterol into neosomal SUV is about 50 more percent. And this is still not enough. So I just talked about the thin film hydration, also the standard method for making a neosome or a neosomal SUV. Um, so we were very fortunate to have the support from PNI and have a unit in our lab. Um, so we were wondering whether we can use their uh, nano assembler bench top to um, manufacture a new form of S um, neosomes with uh, even more cholesterol to stabilize the structure. Um, so the advantage that Benchtop provides is that uh, we can uh, dissolve all the lipid components in the ethanol, uh, in which cholesterol actually has very high solubility. And um, so the working model is that uh, we dissolve all those lipids in 100% ethanol and then collapse these lipids into an aqueous buffer to form this SUV within this microfluidic chip. Uh, because the, this bench tab would uh, provide this really rapid mixing. So it really uh, uh, provides this environment to promote self-assembly before cholesterol would precipitate out. So we thought this method might work for uh, making new forms of uh, neosomes. And indeed, um, so if we look at the data here, so we make our neosomes with uh, just cholesterol and 280. So 280 is another form of uh, non-ionic surfactant. And then we increase the, the molar concentration of cholesterol from, from 1.5 to 1 to 8 to one, so really, uh, really high, right? Um, so we were able to see that uh, uh, the maximum cholesterol we can incorporate into neosome is five to one. So that's 83 more percent of uh, uh, cholesterol. So that's really high. And uh, we can see that the, the, the size remains really small, around 50 to 60 nanometer. Uh, but if we further increase the cholesterol content to eight to one, 
then it's not going to work. Uh, as you see, the, the particle size is huge. Um, so we were wondering, OK, so now we were able to incorporate so much cholesterol into neosomes. Are they still in the SUV form? So we did the cryo TM uh, image and show that indeed it's still an SUV form with uh, um, a single lipid bilayer. And uh, the size is indeed pretty small, about um, 60 nanometer. And now we call this new form of neo neosomes as phospholipid-free SUV or uh, PFSUV because it's made with uh, phospholipids. So it's, it's very different from the uh, liposomal SUV. Um, so now we are able to incorporate more cholesterol into um, the PFSUVs. Are we able to help PFSUVs maintain the transmembrane gradient so we can actively load a, a weak base drug into the core of uh, PFSUVs? Um, so again, we uh, to test this hypothesis, we uh, load <clears throat> doxorubicin into the core of PFSUVs and examine them <clears throat> by a cryo TM. So you see the this empty PFS UV, uh, but after loading with doxorubicin, you can see the crystal of drug inside. So indicating, yes, once the cholesterol is incorporated in a higher amount, the PFS UV is able to hold a transmembrane gradient stably to drive active loading of a drug. Um, so how um, PFS UV is different from the standard liposomal SUV? So in this case, we compare the biodistribution of a pegylated liposomal doxorubicin with our PFSUV doxorubicin. <clears throat> so, so this is the PLD biodistribution after um, IV injection in mice, and we look at doxorubicin concentration at different tissues. Um, so as expected, we see quite a bit of uptake in the RUS tissue, like liver and spleen. Uh, and this is comparison with our PFSUV docs. As you can see that uh, now liver is the predominant tissue that uh, PFSUV target too. Uh, but this is not striking, right? Because many nanoparticles actually go to uh, the liver. Uh, but what is uh, really uh, differentiating our PFSUV is that within the liver, they are targeting the hepatocytes rather than the Kufer cells, which is macrophages in the liver. So this is PLD, and um, then we are looking at uh, their uh, targeting within the liver tissue. So we use this phalloidin stud, uh, staining to differentiate the sinusoidal cells uh, from uh, hepatocytes. <clears throat> and uh, from uh, the image, convocal imaging, you can appreciate that for PLD, they are mostly trapped in the sinusoidal cells, uh, many Cooper cells. But for PFSUV, you see that uh, most of them are delivered to the hepatocytes. Um, so we quantify the image and confirm that uh, about 70% of the hepatocytes are positive with our PFSUV. And uh, the delivery is really efficient. This is happening. Uh, you know, by five minutes and uh, um, up to two hours, uh, the standing is still stable. Um, so one one advantage of uh, the uh, nanoassembly bench top provides is that we can uh, modify or alternate the or uh, altering the uh, microfluidic parameters to uh, change um, uh, particle properties. And then, the, uh, so, so that it will allow us to efficiently generate a library of uh, uh, nanoparticles to optimize our formulation. Okay, so in this case, uh, we can actually change the lipid concentration. We can also mo uh, modify the flow ratio between aqueous phase and organic phase. And we can change the total flow rate. We can determine how fast that we want our nanoparticles to, uh, to be produced. And we can also change the uh, temp manufacturing temperature during uh, lipid assembly. 
Um, so, so in these figures, you can pretty much appreciate that uh, um, by changing these parameters, we can change the particle size and sometimes uh, uh, polydispersity index. Um, so one thing I want to highlight here is that uh, by changing the manufacturing temperature, we were able to produce a range of particle sizes of the PFS UVs from 15 nanometer to 150 nanometer. So this allows us to study the size impact on uh, the biodistribution of nanoparticles with the same formulation. Okay, so this becomes very interesting because uh, uh, in this case, we are comparing larger PFS UVs with smaller PFS UV, UVs. So larger means uh, about 120 nanometer and smaller means about 60 nanometer. Um, so this is uh, a biodistribution study we did. Uh, we label PFS UVs with a, a near-infrared dye, dye R, and IV injected into mice. And this is uh, two hours after injection, but I have to emphasize that even after 24 hours, the data are comparable. Uh, just for convenience, we always look for early time points. Uh, again, just to showcase how efficient the, the, uh, the PFS UV targeting is for uh, the liver and also hepatocytes. Um, so uh, we look at uh, the, the tissue distribution and only three tissues show positive uh, for resins, um, including liver, spleen, and kidney. And you, you know, from this gross, uh, uh, determination of biodistribution, you don't really see much difference between 60 nanometer and 120 nanometer. But if we look into the hypothesis, uh, the intra-liver uh, intra distribution, there's a huge difference between the small and the larger PFS UVs. So again, in the small uh, particle size PFS UVs, you, you see that most of the nanoparticles labeled in red actually are in the hepatocytes. Uh, but on the other hand, the larger particle size PFS UVs, they are trapped in the sinusoids. Um, so again, suggesting that uh, our PFS UVs, smaller ones, are targeting the hepatocytes. And, um, and if we increase the size, then this advantage is no longer exist. And uh, they are a sort of trapped uh, in the sinusoids, not able to penetrate into the hepatocytes. And this is just more um, quantification data showing that uh, for, for the hepatocytes, um, you know, for, uh, uh, you know, th that's rephrased. Um, so about 70% of the hepatocytes are positive with the 60 nanometer particles but only 10% of them were positive with 120 nanometer uh, PFS UVs. On the other hand, uh, for sinusoidal cells, mainly Kufer cells, uh, only 30% of uh, sinusoidal cells are positive with 60 nanometer particles, but about 70% of uh, these sinusoidal cells are positive with the larger particles. So again, suggesting the particle size uh, is determining the intra-liver distribution. Um, so I'm going to talk about the mechanism in just a little bit, but uh, with, with, we think this is a really unique delivery system and want to uh, do a little bit more study to see whether this kind of delivery system can be applied for some medical applications. Uh, the first one we look at is the uh, liver protection because it's delivering a lot of those to the hepatocytes. Um, so the model we use is acetaminophen overdose. So we overdose mice um, and then uh, with 500 milligram per kilogram acetaminophen. And one hour later, we rescue mice with uh, clopropazine in formulated in different uh, formulations, including small uh, PFS UV, big PFS UV, bigger PS, uh, PFS UVs, and um, the just PBS. 
And six hours later, we look at uh, the mice and monitor the liver toxicity. So first we look at uh, ALT, serum ALT. Um, so this is liver enzyme. We want it as low as possible. So you see this untreated or free drug are not so effective, right? So their ALT are very high, but with 60 nanometer, uh, it's, it's almost uh, to, to the normal uh, level. And 100 nanometer PFSUV is not as good as 60 nanometer. So again, this suggested that uh, as long as we can deliver more to the liver, especially the hepatocytes, we can uh, protect the, um, the liver better. Uh, the other results are just supporting the serum A ALT figure. Uh, basically, if uh, the, the best uh, therapeutic outcome is coming from this 60 nanometer uh, PFSUVs showing, uh, you know, uh, reduced necrotic area in the liver. And the, the, the second uh, application we look at is the liver stage malaria. And uh, the, uh, the work just got published in molecular pharmaceuticals. Um, so many, uh, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with malaria, but basically malaria bugs are um, carried by mosquito. And, uh, um, and when, when you get the mosquito bites, the, the bugs can uh, travel uh, into your body and then circulate uh, to the liver, uh, especially hepatocytes first. And this is called liver stage. So it will uh, spend a little bit time in the liver to get them uh, comfortable. And later on, they will spread to the RBC. And that's when the, um, the signs uh, will show up, the, the symptoms of the malaria will show up. And so this is a, a cycle of the malaria uh, parasites. Um, so, we do have lots of uh, drugs effective for treating this uh, blood stage, um, but we only have two drugs that can treat um, uh, the, the malaria in the liver stage because they are sort of in the dormant uh, phase. So they are not so obvious as a target. So again, we have a, a, a lot of anti-malaria drugs for uh, blood stages. Um, but we only have two drugs. One is primaquine, the other is uh, tafenoquine. That is only effective for a uh, liver stage. Um, so the idea is that uh, if we can use these two drugs um, to treat liver stage of uh, malaria, then we probably can have a better uh, curative rate for malaria with uh, fewer relapse. Uh, but the problem is that uh, we cannot uh, widely use these two drugs because they are particularly toxic to red blood cells, especially in G6PD deficient patients. Um, so then we thought, well, maybe PFSUV would be a solution to this problem. Uh, because uh, if we formulate a, a primer queen into our PFSUVs, then primer queen will not be able to access RBC that effectively. Second, uh, PFSUV can target hepatocytes and we can deliver more drugs to the hepatocytes uh, to, to get more effective uh, killing of those bugs. Um, so the following experiments, just to look at uh, whether our hypothesis is correct. Uh, first, we look at uh, um, RBC uptake. This is in vitro results. Um, so we compare the free drug formulation and PFSUV drug formulation. And you see that we can pretty much reduce the RBC uptake by, um, you know, fivefold, or, um, you know, uh, yeah, more than fivefold compared to uh, the, the, uh, the free drug. So this is... Uh, Good news, and we also look at the RBC toxicity study, uh, just the in vitro. Again, we don't have access to G6PD deficient samples, so these are uh, just normal RBC. Um, so the uh, RBC toxicity would be reduced in this case, but it will, also, um, it will still show the difference. 
So in here, we compare hemolysis um, induced by free PQ and the PFS UV PQ. Um, so you see that uh, PFS UV show uh, reduced hemolytic uh, toxicity. So another mechanism of uh, uh, PQ induced uh, RBC toxicity or anemia is that um, it will change the uh, morphology of RBCs and later RBCs will be cleared by the scavenger cells in the body. And um, so here we look at the morphology of RBCs after different treatments. Um, so we have saline, uh, so this wrong, um, you know, wrong shape. And uh, um, so a free PQ, you can see uh, that the morphology is changed uh, significantly. And with PFSUV, the morphology change is, uh, is minimal. And how about liver targeting? Um, so this is the uh, uh, pharmacokinetic study we did uh, to compare different PQ formulations. So we have the PQ by IV, we have free PQ oral, and we have our PFSUV by IV. Um, so not a lot of difference in terms of uh, uh, plasma concentration, but look at the liver uptake. The PFSUV was able to increase the uh, liver delivery by uh, two to five fold compared to the other uh, delivery methods or uh, formulations. Um, so the last one I wanna talk about in terms of application is hepatitis B. And again, we haven't published the data, so just for your reference, uh, hopefully we will get the story finished soon and then disclose the whole story. But I just want to say that uh, the hepatitis, uh, hepatitis B is still a very difficult uh, disease to uh, treat. And one drug that is used clinically is interferon alpha, but it's inducing a lot of uh, toxicity in human, uh, in human patients. So our idea is that uh, what if we can deliver an immune boosting agent to the uh, liver and then locally increase the interferon alpha in the liver uh, without increasing the systemic interferon alpha concentration. Would that uh, reduce the toxicity, but in the meantime, boost the efficacy? Um, so this is the preliminary data we have. So we inject our formulation into mice and then uh, major uh, interferon alpha concentrations either in the liver or in the plasma. So you see that uh, uh, we can produce a sevenfold increase AUC in the liver compared to the plasma. So again, just showing that uh, our formulation is really effective in delivering different types of drugs and uh, to the liver and uh, likely gonna have uh, different applications for different um, liver diseases. Um, so now let's talk about the mechanism. Why do PFSUVs target hepatocytes, right? So first, uh, we have data showing that uh, the serum components is doing something to help the PFSUVs going into the hepatocytes. Um, so this is in vitro study. We use HEPG2 cells. And so this is a liver cell line. And uh, so we load a a dye into PFSUVs so we can quantify the delivery uh, rel relatively easily. And so first we compare the uptake by HAP G2 cells uh, in different conditions, both uh, serum or without serum. So you see that uh, the with a serum group is showing very, very uh, improved delivery or a cellular uptake of the PFSUV suggesting the serum components is helping uh, the delivery um, into the hepatocytes. And second, uh, we have data. Um, still, we need to perfect our protein absorption data, but we have data suggesting that uh, it's upper lipoproteins that are helping the nanoparticles going into the hepatocytes. Um, so in here, we first look at different um, apple lipoproteins, including apple A, apple C, apple E. 
And only Apple A is helping uh, PFS UVs uh, sell their uptake by HEP G2 cells. And uh, on the right-hand side, uh, we just increased the Apple A concentration in the uh, culture medium. And then see that uh, the uptake is increased with increasing Apple A concentration, suggesting Apple A is uh, indeed at least one of the major components contributing to um, PFS UV uptake by the HEP G2 cells. And we know that uh, Apple A is a major component in um, a high density lipoprotein. Uh, and uh, is going into the hepatocytes through the scavenger receptor B1. Okay, um, so in here, we just uh, uh, incubate the, the mixture uh, you know, of our formulation and apple A with, apple, uh, with uh, BLT1, which is a, a scavenger receptor B1 in inhibitor. And indeed, we see that once the receptor is inhibited, the uptake is decreased significantly, suggesting that um, our uh, nanoparticles are, uh, are going into the uh, hepatocytes through this um, uh, Apple A and scavenger receptor B1 pathway. So to summarize, um, I, I just want to show you this cartoon to uh, illustrate the delivery mechanism of uh, this unique PFS UV formulation. So um, upon IV injection, the PFS UV is going into the liver because there's lots of blood flow going to the liver. And then uh, in this uh, microenvironment in the sinusoids, there would be some uh, protein absorption, of especially apple A to the surface of PFS UVs. And because of the size, small size, they are able to penetrate between the uh, fenestra uh, uh, in the sinusoidal uh, structure. And uh, uh, in the um, space dissect, uh, there would be likely increased concentration of apple A uh, in this um, microenvironment, and uh, more apple A absorbed to the surface of PFS UVs, and then recognized by the scavenger receptor B1 expressed by the hepatocytes for internalization of uh, our formulation. Um, so, again, although we were able to incorporate more cholesterol into the formulation, we still have about 20, 20 more percent of the 2080. Is that safe? Um, is our PFS UV safe? So first we look at this hemolysis because 2080 is still a suspected, although it's a, it's a um, F, FDA approved recipient. Um, so in here we look at hemolysis. Um, First, uh, even 280 itself is not particularly hemolytic because again, it's FDA approved. But look at the um, after incorporation into PFS UV, right? So uh, the, there's almost no, no hemolytic toxicity. So pretty safe. Another thing we worry about is the complement activity uh, activation. Uh, so we don't want our nanoparticles to activate our immune systems. And a lot of nanoparticles actually interact with complement, including liposomes. So in this case, we um, did an, a complement activation assay and uh, discovered that the PFS UV is pretty inert, at, the, at least in this concentration, which is not uh, um, low, um, uh, low at all. So, so we have, we believe a PFS UV is quite safe. And we further perform an acute, acute uh, liver toxicity assay, but um, this is a busy slide, but you just uh, need to take my words. Um, uh, we look at uh, um, the, the uh, serology and blood chemistry and the histology uh, 24 hours after PFS UV treatment and we don't see any toxicity, acute toxicity um, in the liver or uh, systemically. All right, so uh, just a quick summary. So we were able to 
uh, used a nano assembler bench top to incorporate a high amount of cholesterol into neosomes and produce a new formulation called PFSUB. And uh, we have sh uh, shown you uh, several examples of why um, and uh, how uh, PFSUVs target uh, the hypothesis and uh, uh, what kind of uh, uh, applications we can use for, uh, for uh, PFSUV drug targeting. Oops, um, I just want to recognize my team. And uh, these are people uh, directly contributing to this project. Um, but again, I want to say thank you to all uh, my lab members. They are more or less contribute uh, to this uh, project and the overall lab research. And my collaborators, uh, Peter Collis and uh, p and I, and uh, my funding to um, uh, my research program. Thank you very much. I would like to take any questions you have. Dr. Lee, thank you so much. You know, I appreciate you. I appreciate the whole work, hard work you're doing up there at, in Vancouver. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for being a colleague and for sharing this. Everyone else, thank you so much for attending our West Hour here in the, in the West region. Feel free to promote it to your colleagues and your friends. We're, we're going to have one more for the year uh, in October, and then we're going to go on a hiatus because of the holiday seasons and where the last Wednesday of the month ends. As you all recall, of course, West webinars are the West, the last Wednesday of every month. And we also have, of course, our journal clubs, which are the second Friday of every month. So we'll have one more West webinar. We'll have a couple more of our journal clubs. Star, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for the presentation. Greatly appreciated. And everyone who attended, thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.